The Nigeria Governor's Forum says infectious disease bills should be stepped down because governors were not properly consulted. And cut your expenses now and save Nigeria from economic trouble. Atiku advises Buhari. I am Benny Ark and this is Plus Politics. The 36 state governors under the ages of the Nigerian Governors Forum, NGF, have criticized the controversial control of infectious diseases bill sponsored by the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Femi Bajabiamila. The chairman of the forum, Governor Kao Defiami of Ekiti State, in a statement he signed on Wednesday, said the bill lacks proper consultation of governors and should be stepped down. I'm being joined by Chateau Lu, political scientist via phone, and also Dr. Charles Omole, a legal security and political strategist via Skype, all the way in the UK, London. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us this evening on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Dr. Charles, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. Okay, I'm hoping Dr. Sh uh, Dr. Chateau is going to join us later on in the course of the show. Now, let's, let's get the show started this way now. Dr. Charles. Mm. The Nigerian Governors Forum have criticized the controversial control of infectious diseases bill sponsored by the Speaker of the House of Representatives, um, Honorable Femi Bajabiamila. Let's contemplate this just for a moment, if you will. Hmm. Well, I mean, um, the criticism of uh, the Governors Forum is valid. Uh, although we have to make it clear that when it comes to infectious disease, uh, if that's a national problem and national prerogative, not that of states. Uh, because uh, an infectious person moves from Lagos to Ogun State, so who deals with it? Moves from Ogun State or your state, who deals with it? So certain things have to be national in nature. But I think you know, the, the challenge with uh, this bill, because I have to say from the beginning, is the fact that it was adapted from uh, Singapore uh, Infectious Diseases Bill of yes. 19... 76, I think, which, by the way, they've since amended themselves. But that was more or less what it was kind of, you know, brought from. But then the context of Singapore was that Singapore was a, you know, was a totalitarian one-party state, you know, at that time. Uh, many, might, many, many might say maybe they are still in, they are still are, you know, a one-party state, you know, by and large. But the key point, you know, I'm trying to make, you know, about that is the fact that Singapore was a one city country. It's a very small country. So a lot of the peculiarities of a nation like Nigeria doesn't really, is not really reflected in that bill. And that's a major problem. So clearly consultations have to be made. Um, last week, uh, I actually did a draft in my own, I produced my own version of the bill, so to speak. And I put it on my um, I put it on my uh, Twitter handle at Dr. C. Omole. And uh, interestingly, you know, the, the, the staff of uh, the speaker got in touch with me, and the following day, the speaker himself got in touch with me, and, uh, you know, about how, you know, we can help perfect this bill. So the bill clearly has potential. We need a new bill, because one thing, I, one thing Nigerians need to understand is that the uh, Quarantine Act that it seeks to replace it's a 1926 colonial act, which is no longer, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, fit for purpose in many respects. For example, the financial penalty under the quarantine act, if you don't obey, is just 200 naira. So, I mean, 200 naira cannot deter anybody. But that is the law as of today. Just 200 naira fine is a, is a financial penalty. You know, and the quarantine act doesn't deal with what happens at the ports, at the airports, seaports. You know, so there are so many things that, is, that are missing, so to speak, that we need to perfect. But the bill is well-intentioned. We need that bill, but there are so many issues with it. Interestingly, you did make mention to Singapore. Now, the bill sponsored by Mr. Bajabia Miller seeks to, among others, make possession of health card mandatory for international travelers living or arriving in Nigeria, just like the yellow fever card. Well, you did say there's an existing similar law in Singapore, and some Nigerians have labeled it as draconian and unfit for a democratic Nigeria. Do you agree with that? Yes, I do. I do agree with that. That uh, you cannot make it a criminal offense for people to refuse to, uh, to take vaccination. Um, you know, although in my bill, because we have to balance the need of one to that of many, 
you know, there are consequences. We cannot say, I mean, you cannot say you will not, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, take vaccination and then there's no consequence to it. First of all, let me say this. You see, the, the, the background to this problem is lack of trust in government. That's, a, that's the first thing we need to understand. When people trust their government, they, they give them benefit of the doubt whenever they say something. But that trust doesn't exist in Nigeria. And the political class have themselves to blame for that. You know, they've not proven themselves to be trustworthy to Nigerians. As a result, when anything is said, Nigerians will imagine the worst case scenario, so to speak. So what needs to happen, uh, the way I see it, is that, yes, government might say, okay, there's this particular pandemic, you need to get vaccination, you can refuse to... Uh, to be vaccinated, but then there may be some consequences. For example, government might say public schools, you know, you cannot attend public school unless your child is, you know, your child can attend public school unless your child is vaccinated. That is not new. In U.S., many states have such laws already, you know, you, you know, uh, aware, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, vaccination against measles and some other childhood diseases are, you know, as it were, uh, made mandatory before you can become part of uh, uh, public schools. But then that vaccination itself is not made compulsory because you can choose to educate your child privately, you know, so so in which case, you know, vaccination or no vaccination, it makes no difference. Right, so Nigerians Charles. must always yeah. have a choice. Okay, Dr. Charles, we're going to do this. We're going to come to a few articles in the on the bill being proposed to see how this goes against what you just said in, in your last, in your statement. Now, we've been yes. joined by phone, also on the show by Dr. Shete Olu, a political scientist. Dr. Shete, thank you for joining on the show. Good evening. Good evening. How are you this evening, Dr. Shete? Oh, very well, thank you. Great. I need your reaction quickly to the Nigerian Governor's Forum criticizing the proposed the bill before the House of Rep and asking for it to be stepped down. What, how do you react to this? Well, uh, I, 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 I do not support uh, the step down of the, of the bill. I, I am familiar with the controversies the bill I generated. I, I, I'm also familiar with the criticisms of the civil society. But I would prefer it runs its full cost. It's, it's, uh, it's, um, it's, it's interesting and good enough that um, there will be a public hearing. And public hearing should provide the opportunity to expose the weaknesses, you know, and the contradictions, you know, in the bill. And in the long run, I would expect that the aspects of the bill that violate rights, that, that, um, that appears authoritarian, would be expunged. We, we certainly need a new bill. The quarantine bill of 1929 is outdated. We, we need a bill to reflect new realities and to respond to new challenges. Um, okay, you, you think it's outdated. And now, do you think this bill is a suitable replacement for we, Dr. Shete? Well, the, 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 bill, the bill might not be exact replacement, uh, you know, the way it is. I made the point. I'm, I'm familiar with booby traps, okay. you know, in the bill. I'm also, I also know that there are contentious areas in the bill. The point I'm making is those contentious areas should be debated, you know, and should be resolved. Right. Uh, and no. we could have a, a bill that respects rights, that's consonant with the rule of law, and does not violate human dignity. Dr. These Charles, are my arguments. Yeah. Now, Dr. Charles, this is to you. The, the bill which came second reading before it was stood down recently has 82 sections. And the speaker, Femi Bajabia Miller, defended the bill, saying it was required as the Quarantine Act or military error law is outdated. But do you consider this a suitable replacement? Oh, definitely, oh, de definitely not. It is definitely not a suitable replacement. Uh, we do need a replacement, but uh, you know uh, that doesn't mean uh, we should just accept anything. There are several problems I have with the with the bill as I was proposed. Number one, it gives so much power to the Director General of NCDC to act in a massive way, even almost exercising the power of the president, so to speak, without warrant or court order. That for me is a major problem. So they can, you know, so you can, you can give instruction for your premises to be invaded. 
you know, use any force necessary without a court order. That can't be, that can be happening. That can happen in a democratic society. So things like that, there has to be checks and balance. You know, and, 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 and like I was, you know, when I was speaking to the speaker's uh, team the, last week, one thing I told them myself, for example, here in the UK, for example, if somebody is mentally unstable and the police find that, okay, you have become a danger to yourself and to the public, the police will come to a judge and obtain what we call mental health warrant. That warrant will be signed, will, will, will be argued, and if, if granted, it will now give police power to arrest that person and treat that person against their will. Now, that can be done, but there has to be an independent oversight. But the way it's been crafted in the bill, when the director general, if he does something and you are not happy, you can only appeal to the minister of health. And the decision of the minister of health is final. That can happen in a democratic society. So because both of them are members of executive. So the executive cannot be checking themselves. So when an executive decision is made, it's for the judiciary to act as a checks and balance, not a co-member of the executive. So that's just another example of, of problems within the bill. You know? And also the bill, for example, we say things like, uh, you know, the, the NCDC can command, can instruct uh, a doctor who owns a hospital anywhere in Nigeria to bring samples of uh, people that, uh, that are suspected to, you know, to have had any infectious disease. But the bill doesn't say who pays the bill. If you, you, know, if you go to Ife or somewhere in Gotangora and you have hospital there and somebody says bring all your 50 samples to Abuja, who is going to pay for the bill? Who's going to pay for your flight to Abuja? The bill is silent on all those things. You know, so this, um, so, so my challenge generally is that, you know, Nigeria is a place where we need to understand that most of our laws are full of mischiefs and lacunas. And I see the, the law, the bill is silent on so many areas that can be used for mischief later on. So in my own version, which I published on my Twitter handle, by Dr. C. Omole last week, I explained certain areas and I brought everything under judicial control. One more thing quickly. Another thing that I found I was wrong with the bill is the bill says use a health officer and police interchangeably. So an health officer can arrest you. So the question I'm asking is, what training does a health officer have to arrest anybody in Nigeria? You know, so I replaced all that to mean only the police can arrest. So if a health officer feels that they need to act, go and get the police, let them do their job. Okay. But currently the bill says health officer can arrest. Yeah. When did right, that right, start? Dr. Dr. Charles, just hold, hold your thought right there. We'll come back to you. Um, Dr. Shete, the, the yes. governors evidently were not consulted. And just last week here, after the bill scaled the second reading, the NCDC also said they were not participatory or consulted in its formulation. Now, do you think this fuel any hidden agenda, making the speaker's defense hollow and very suspicious indeed? Because you already well, said that there are booby traps in within that bill. Well, it's, uh, it, it will be, it will be uh, the, the, the circumstances suggest that that uh, the House of Representatives is desperate to substitute the quarantine quarantine law with uh, with with the with the with the new law, you know. And maybe I suppose that explains uh, the speed. Should they should they should know, they be the lack of should do process cetera, should do process, Doctor Shete? The absence of Doctor Shete, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, you say you do understand that there is a desperation from the House of Rep, but should yes. this override the need for due process to be followed? No, no, no. Excuse me, I'm not defending the desperation. Okay. I'm explaining the context. I'm okay. providing the context. Please go ahead. Yeah. That the House of Reps obviously is desperate to substitute the quarantine hall law with, with, with the new law, you know, it, but it, it's not sufficient premise to violate uh, you know, the law to violate, uh, you know, legislative process for lawmaking it is not sufficient ground to disregard the rule of law and to disrespect human rights and violate human rights with impunity and, and so on and so forth. But the point I'm making is, you know, uh, it's a bill, it's not a law. And it's all binding, uh, you know, as, as it is on the Nigerian people, you know. You recall that. The House of Reps, at, at the point, they insisted there would not be public hearing. And there were outcries, there were protests, there were agitations. And the Speaker, you know, on behalf of the House of Reps, conceded that there would be public hearing. 
That for me is, is a major success for the civil society and the critiques of the bill. So the, the critiques, the civil society organizations, those who represent interest groups on health-related issues, human rights issues, et cetera, lawyers, sociologists, et cetera, those who are in the health, the health sector, will have the window, we have the opportunity to attend the public hearings, submit memoranda, et cetera, to criticize the bill, to expose the flaws, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. And I will expect that those, those, those flaws, those criticisms, and the deficiencies and the shortcomings of the bill will constitute the basis for a reformed bill that will respect human rights, that will respect human dignity, you know, that will respect the rule of law, etc. Right. Definitely, Don't... I expect that the due process in terms of lawmaking process to be strictly adhered to. Right. That should not be compromised. All right. Dr. Charles, it's, it's amazing that since the introduction of this infectious diseases bill, it has drawn a whole wide range of controversies. And recently, even a very reputable cleric, um, Bishop Oyedipo, did say the, the proponents of this bill have even intention. Now, is it because the bill seeks to repeal the Quarantine Act and replace it with the Control of Infectious Diseases Bill, or is this just a case of mistrust and lack of confidence in the government by the people? Well, I think one can say maybe it's a combination of everything, to be quite frank with you. Like I said earlier, lack of trust in government is a fundamental deficiency in Nigeria, that even if government is well-intentioned, people will be suspicious of them because government have not proven themselves to be trustworthy you know, so far. Now, the speaker, I would say, is well-intentioned in, in, in trying to you know, bring this bill. I think maybe he might not have considered some of the you know, implications of, of the bill as it is. But the, issue, but the issue here is, yes, the bill is needed. We need a new bill. And I think, you know, strategically, I think the mistake the speaker made here was if when, if after the second reading of the bill, he had said, we are going to go to public hearings, a lot of the criticism will have been toned down because people will wait for the public hearing. I think it was the information that was sent out, or at least people felt that public hearing was not, was going to be bypassed. That is what made people a lot more agitated, that this now was not being forced on them. Now, any time you are bypassing, I'll have a right to bypass you know, public consultation, that is true. But any time you are doing something so speedily, people will ask why there is suspicion. So clearly, I mean, Nigeria is a country full of rumors. There are all kinds of rumors going on about uh, you know, what may or may not happen. But the, I, I don't believe in, you know, although those rumors, I believe it's a well-intentioned bill. I just feel it was not thought out very well. It was not bespoke to Nigeria to reflect our peculiarities. So, uh, and that I think is a problem of the bill drafters, you know, uh, uh, which I think the speaker and his team should have picked up before the bill was made public. Now let's take a good look at Article 6 of the 2005 UNESCO Declaration on Bioethics and Human Rights. I believe you're, you're very much aware of that. Can, can we critically analyze the proposed Control of Infectious Diseases Bill 2020 and how much of this is a violation of human rights in, in, in light of the UNESCO Declaration of 2005, Article 6? Well, I mean, I mean, you know, I mean the, the fact is, I mean, like I told you the, there are countries that have, uh, you know, infectious diseases bill that's similar to the bill. Uh, so infectious diseases, diseases law that's similar to the bill we already have. So we are not make breaking any grounds in the world, you know, on, on that basis. But the, but the truth of the matter is what, you know, uh, UNESCO puts, puts out in, the, in its declaration merely reflect basic equity and fairness in terms of following due process. You know, and like I said, this bill does not, as it is, does not follow due process. The judiciary is completely shut out in the bill, the way it's been constructed. The NCDC can make decisions all over the place, yeah. can use any force necessary, you know. And, and like I said, uh, 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 you know, a health officer can even, you know, as it were, uh, 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 arrest people. You know, I mean, when, I mean, like I said, the power of arrest is only in our police. You know, so there's so many things in the bill that needs to be fine-tuned. And speaking with the speaker and his people, I'm happy that going to public consultation, you know, many of us will be able to make appropriate representation to perfect the bill. By the way, you know, there's a whole sway of the bill that relates to commercial tankers, you know, hair, you know, hairlines coming to Nigeria that are completely uncontentious. 
You know, so so we shouldn't think the whole bill is bad. Yeah. There's a whole swing of it that actually is needed. That the quarantine act doesn't even touch at all. Yes. You know, uh, uh, but when it comes to the individual Nigerians and businesses, that is the problem. I mean, let me let me give another instance. For example, you know, the bill says the NCDC boss can tell you if he suspects that you have infectious disease to clean your to, to, to clean your, your, your premises, commercial premises. But more importantly, it can specify how you should clean it, what chemical you should use to clean it. Without your and consent. And it can specify for how long you should clean it. You know, even, without, even without your consent. Even without exactly. your consent. That, that's exactly my point. Yes. Without your consent, and more importantly, which is what the bill did not discuss, which my own version discussed, who pays for it? Because if NCDC is telling you to clean your, your it's not, they are not telling you to just uh, use vacuum cleaner to clean your premises. They are specifying what chemical you should use. They are specifying how, how many days you must, you must you do it for. If they are doing all that and costing $3 million and you don't have the $3 million, what happens to your property? All right, let, let, me, go to, let me go to Dr. Know? Shete. Dr. Shete, let me bring you up now. Part 4 of that bill, also known as the NCDC bill, Article 46 to 49, entitled Vaccination and Other Prophylaxis, seeks to compel Nigerians, the underscored word there is compel Nigerians to embrace, you know, the, the vaccines and other prophylaxis in contradiction of Article 6 of the UNESCO Declaration on Bioethics and Human Rights. I, I will not party to this treaty with UNESCO or our lawmakers just feigning ignorant of this agreement here and declaration by UNESCO as contained in Article, Article 6. You see, my reaction is this. We should not overflog these issues. There, there, is, there is the opportunity for, for, for public hearing. Every issue, every contentious position should be, should, should be, should be discussed, should be debated and argued at, 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 at the public hearing. There's, you know, uh, the, the aspect on, of vaccination is no doubt a violation of rights. You know, as it, it's not consistent with the fundament, the ground norm of Nigeria, which is the 99 Constitution as amended. And it's, it's certainly not consistent with the UNESCO declaration. It's certainly not consistent with the African Charter on Human Rights and Universal Declaration of, on Human Rights. It's not cons it is not consistent with every known law. But the point I'm making is, you know, I'm optimistic that, that civil society, which, which I'm a member of, the civil society organizations, which I'm a member of, are very articulate, are very well informed, and should be presenting well-informed and well-argued and well-rounded arguments, you know, on the bill. So the point I'm making is the bill may as well be defeated at the public hearing stage. There, there's no rule that suggests that, you know, that a bill must kill, you know, public hearing to third reading and, and then become a law. It, it, it might as well be defeated when, when it is obvious that it violates uh, the, the, the essential fabrics of the society. We, sh we, should, we should save the gunpowder for the public hearing. We should save the gunpowder for the public hearing. Every group that is interested in the bill, that has issues with the bill, should wait for the public hearing to articulate and ventilate you know, its position on contentious areas. All right, you Dr. Know, we should save the gunpowder. All right. Dr. Charles, finally, before I let you go this evening, and by the way, Dr. Charles, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, yeah. and also by way of recommendation. Now, on the contrary, Article 6 of the UNESCO Declaration stresses the importance of consent on the issue of vaccination and other activities that relates to human rights. You know, um, the, the, the underscored word there is consent. By way of recommendation, and the bill is going to public hearing, what would you recommend at this point in time, given every clause contained in this bill? Well, I think... Clearly, like I told you earlier, part of the problem is the fact that the, the Speaker, uh, at least the House of Rep, gave the feelers out that they were not going to do public consultation. That's what led to the uproar. But now that we have public consultation, I think it, it is right to you know, allow that process. But the key issue for me is the fact that you know, the issue of consent is important because what I actually, you know, in, in my own version of the bill that I drafted, what I said, for example, I said, the NCDC, uh, 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 NCDC uh, uh, you know, Ed, you know, Director General, after consultation with either the individual or the business and the state concerned, we arrive at a particular decision. If consultation fails, then the NCDC has to go to a court to obtain an order. So there are two states, 
One is a time to obtain consent. Inform people might consent to you know what you want to do. Number two, if consent fails, go to the court, get a court order to compel what you want to do. You know, that is what happens in democratic society. And I think that is what we're asking for here. Don't just give uh, one man power to do as he pleases. And, uh, you know, and uh, clearly the strategy also has been wrong. But I'm sure the public consultation will help to clear all these things up. Dr. Charles Omole, legal, security, and political strategist. Thank you for joining us on the show and for your insightful contribution. Thank you very much. And also, Dr. Chateau Liu, thank you very much for your contribution on this segment. And you're with us on the next. Thank you very much, Dr. Chateau. Thank you, Mr. Bye. We'll take a short break now. Atiku Abubakar advises President Buhari on how to save our economy. This is up next for the discussion. Stay with us.